Welcome to our video lecture on meiosis, also known as meiosis. You can say it however you want to say it. I prefer meiosis, but you do you. Uh, um, our essential understanding for today is that alleles, remember these are different forms of a gene, segregate, remember that means just to separate uh, during meiosis, which allows for new combinations to be formed by the fusion of gametes. Fusion of gametes is simply fertilization. So basically we're going to look at how do we take those alleles on chromosomes, separate or segregate those chromosomes so that we have lots of different combinations that can lead to lots of genetic diversity when eggs and sperm fuse during fertilization. Our objectives, we're going to distinguish between mitosis and meiosis. We're going to describe those stages of meiosis and define non-disjunction. We're going to wrap up with a little explanation of the relationship between meiosis and genetic variation, which is super important. So to start off, mitosis versus meiosis, mitosis versus meiosis. Um, both of them are going to start with some interphase. Remember that interphase is that stage where we have G1, S, G2. Uh, the cell is going to hang out in, my, in interphase longer than any other stage. Um, S is when DNA replication occurs. In mitosis, we're going to have PMAT just one time. So prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, PMAT. We're just going to have that one time. Um, remember that that nuclear membrane is going to break down. We're going to line up at the equatorial plate or the center of the cell. And then during anaphase, we're going to separate the chromosomes that are double wide because of that DNA replication. We're going to separate those chromosomes at the centromeres, and that's going to lead to two daughter cells. We have two total daughter cells, um, and they're genetic clones of the parent cell. So both of these cells are genetically identical to that parent cell that we started with here in the beginning. That's different from meiosis. So in meiosis, we're going to still do PMAT, but we're actually going to do it two times. So we'll have PMAT number one and then PMAT number two. Um, we're going to still have interphase. We're still going to replicate the DNA during synthesis. Um, in, and then we're going to do PMAT number one. There's going to be a sometimes a short interface between meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, but we are not going to go through any DNA replication here. We're going to separate the, the chromosomes one more time, and so we actually end up with, instead of two daughter cells, we have four, and each of them have half the number of chromosomes that the parent cell had, they're going to be genetically unique. They will be different from that parent cell. So we have two cells, we have four cells. We're going to start everything. Everything's going to start at diploid. Remember, that's the 2n number in humans. It's 46. At the end of mitosis, we still have 46 chromosomes in each cell. But at the end of meiosis in humans, we only have 23 chromosomes. And these will be gametes instead of somatic or body cells. So just a quick look at a very basic life cycle of humans. Um, so, so here we have some humans. Humans have ovaries and testes. The ovaries will make eggs. The testes will make sperm through this process of meiosis. Those eggs and sperm will be haploid. Remember that haploid means half the number of chromosomes. So 23 for humans, different numbers for other species. What happens during fertilization, the 23 chromosomes in the egg, the 23 chromosomes in the sperm combine to make 46, which is our 2n or diploid number. This first giant cell, this fertilized egg, is called a zygote. The zygote is going to go through lots of mitosis. And so we have genetically identical cells popping up. And then they'll start going through some differentiation. We'll have lots of different genes activated in different cells. And we'll end up with these adults who, again, will sometimes have ovaries and sometimes will have testes. Um, and will make eggs and sperm. And the cycle can continue. Quick review of mitosis. We're going to start in interphase. The same will happen in meiosis. Um, during interphase, the cell is just going to be doing its job, whatever that job might be. And one more time, G1, S, and G. Oh, that's a 2, G2. Um, G1 and G2 are those gaps. S is synthesis for DNA replication. 
the cell is growing, the cell is doing its job, it's also copying some organelles, and then during S, of course, it's going to double its DNA. DNA replication occurs during the S phase. During prophase, the chromatin, which is that unraveled DNA, uh, is going to condense into chromosomes. It's going to coil up. Supercoiling is going to occur. We're going to have some lovely chromosomes instead of that unraveled, super messy chromatin. The nuclear membrane is also going to break down. Metaphase in the middle, we're going to line up those chromosomes at the equatorial plate. Anaphase, spindle fibers are going to rip those chromosomes apart at the centromeres um, and pull them to opposite poles of the cell. During telophase, a uh, nuclear membrane is going to start to reform around each new clump of chromosomes. Those chromosomes are going to unwind back into chromatin, and then we'll also have some cytokinesis happen. If it is an animal cell, we'll have cleavage furrows during cytokinesis. If we have a plant cell, that cell plate will start to form. That new baby cell wall will form. Um, we will end up with two daughter cells that are genetically identical to the parent. So let's talk about uh, interphase one more time. G1, S, G2, G1, and G2 are those gaps. We're going to have lots of growth. We're going to have lots of cell function. We're going to duplicate some organelles. S is synthesis of the DNA. It is DNA replication. This happens for both mitosis and meiosis. Meiosis, how it's different from mitosis. Interphase is the same. We're going to have meiosis one and meiosis two. So instead of just one PMAT, we have PMAT one and then PMAT two. Lots of things happen in prophase one. Um, and there are lots of special names for all the different things that happen in prophase one. We just need to know prophase one. We need to know a lot happens. We'll talk about those details in the next couple of slides, but we just need to know prophase one, lots of things happen. Metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one. Sometimes we might have a short interkinesis, which is like interphase without, without synthesis. So we might pause and have a little gap, but there will be no more DNA replication happening. Um, and then we'll fly into PMAT two, prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase, and telophase two. And then at the end, we'll have tetrads. We'll have one, two, three, four gametes. Each of those gametes will be haploid um, and genetically different from the parent cell. So all those amazing things that happen during prophase one. Um, chromatin is going to condense. What that means is that the chromatin, that unraveled DNA, is going to condense into chromosomes. Those chromosomes are then going to pair up and the specific pairs that we make are homologous pairs. This happens during a process called synapsis. Synapsis is just this process of the homologous chromosomes finding each other, making these pairs. We're going to give those pairs of homologous chromosomes some extra special vocabulary. Um, we call them bivalent tetrads, um, or just bivalence. So bivalence, bi means two. We have two chromosomes. Um, they are homologous. Tetrads. The reason we call them tetrads is because DNA replication has already occurred by this point. And so each one of our chromosomes, one that we got from mom and one that we got from dad, each one of these chromosomes is already doubled because we had DNA replication happen way back in interphase during that S or synthesis phase. So we, we have copied the DNA. Each one of our chromosomes is double wide. These two arms we're going to call chromatids. The two arms of this chromosome that I got from mom are genetically identical to each other. Same genes and same alleles. This chromosome that I got from dad, which is homologous to the chromosome that I got from mom, is going to have the same genes, but not necessarily the same alleles as those chromatids on this chromosome that I got from my mom. So if we're talking maybe all about hair color here, maybe, so these are all hair color genes, but maybe on mom I got brown hair and on dad I got blonde hair. Same gene, gene for hair color, different alleles, Mom gave me brown and dad gave me blonde. We call this a tetrad because we've got those one, two, three, four different chromatids, arms of the chromosomes. We have four arms because replication has occurred. It's bivalent because we have a pair. The pair is homologous because these chromosomes have the same genes, 
same genes in the same locations of these chromosomes. So the chromatin has condensed, Homolo homologous chromosomes paired up during synapsis. We have our bivalent tetrads. The nuclear membrane is going to break down. And then this most amazing thing called crossing over is going to occur. Crossing over occurs when we have chunks of homologous chromosomes trade pieces with each other. So let's say this is the, the chromosome that I got from dad, and this is the chromosome that I got from mom. They have the same genes, but not necessarily the same alleles. Crossing over is going to occur. Chiasmata, these are the locations where crossing over occurs. And so that spot right there where these chromosomes are attached to each other, that would be a chiasma, chiasmata is plural. So what's going to happen is they're going to trade chunks. This chunk that used to be dad is now going to be on mom's chromosome. And this chunk that used to be on mom is now going to be on dad's chromosome. So at the very end, I'm going to have these re recombinant chromatids. This chromatid is still all dad, and this chromatid is still all mom. But I now have more genetic variation because this chromatid is some of dad and some of mom. And this chromatid is some of mom and some of dad. This is going to increase our genetic variation, which allows for our species to better survive environmental changes. So here's another look at crossing over. It's always going to happen between the non-sister chromatids. It would be silly for dad and dad to trade chunks with each other because these are genetically identical to each other. We want to trade a little piece of dad and a little piece of mom so that we have some new recombined recombinant DNA. We're going to exchange maternal and paternal DNA. Trading dad with dad means nothing actually changed. These new combinations of alleles on these chromatids are going to contribute to lots of variation of traits in the species. The reason that we don't all look exactly like our moms or our dads or our grandmas is because, um, at least in part, because of this amazing crossing over. I love this picture because it's showing us that crossing over doesn't happen just in one spot, but can actually happen in a couple. And so here we've traded some mom and some dad and some dad and some mom. And so you can see these different chunks in different spots. We're going to have lots of different combinations of alleles on these chromosomes because of crossing over. This amazing image, micrograph, showing us lots of chiasmata. Remember again, chiasmata are those spots where crossing over is occurring, where those chromosomes are attached to each other and trading chunks. Here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. So all of these spots are showing us where, let me erase my scratches so that you can see a little bit better. So all of these spots are showing us that crossing over is occurring. This chromosome and this chromosome are trading chunks. Crazy cool, right? So cool. All right, so uh, in ovaries, this does not happen in testes. This happens over, only in ovaries, in uh, human ovaries. Um, meiosis starts to occur in ovaries before birth. So a fetus is starting to grow some ovaries. Meiosis is going to start to happen in the ovaries before that fetus is even born. Those eggs are already in the ovaries. Um, but what's super interesting is that meiosis is actually going to stop or arrest. It's going to stop or arrest um, during prophase one. So in the embryo, in the fetus, we're going to start going through meiosis that um, prophase one is where this guy is going to stop. Pause, right? Um, and, and at that pause, there are about two million eggs in the ovaries of a human. During puberty, um, meiosis is going to pick back up. So we're going to restart meiosis um, during puberty, generally once per cycle. And we'll talk about the menstrual cycle in our physiology unit later this year. Um, so we're going to pause meiosis, restart at puberty one per cycle, generally. Um, and then and then this is crazy sauce egg pops out um, of the ovary, heads into the fallopian tube. It's going to pause again 
meiotic arrest again now in meiosis II. If, if there's fertilization, if the sperm enters the egg, then finally meiosis II will be completed. The sperm will fertilize the egg and then we'll have that zygote, that fertilized egg. Crazy cool, right? So we start with about 2 million eggs at birth. By the time we hit age 18, a lot of them have died off, have gone through apoptosis. We're down to only 100,000 eggs by the age of 18. My, my friends with ovaries, you can only have 100,000 children. So sorry. Um, by the time we get to age 50, more have died. The great majority of them have died. And we're down with only 100. So, so if you have moms who are in their 50s, they can only have about 100 more children. And that's ridiculous. No one is going to have 100 more children. Um, but those eggs do die off um, as, as we age. So kind of an interesting thing. So let's say that we've made it through all of prophase one and we have made it into metaphase one. Um, what's going to happen, still metaphase in the middle. Spindle fibers are going to attach to the centromeres just like in mitosis and we're going to pull homologous chromosomes to the equatorial plate. This is different from mitosis. In mitosis, we lined up our chromosomes single file on the equatorial plate. So we lined them up single file. In mitosis, single file. Here in meiosis one, metaphase one, notice that our chromosomes are in pairs along that equatorial plate. We are lining up our homologous chromosomes in pairs along the middle, metaphase in the middle, but now we're pairs in the middle. Anaphase one, anaphase is going to follow metaphase one. Now the spindle fibers, spindle microtubules are gonna pull not the centromeres apart like we do in mitosis, but instead we're going to pull apart those homologous pairs to opposite poles of the cell. So in mitosis, we were pulling apart those chromosomes at the centromere, one half would go one way, one half would go the other way. That's not what's happening here. Here, we're going to take those pairs of chromosomes and we're gonna separate the pairs first. So we've separated the pairs. Um, homologous pairs are heading to opposite poles of the cell. And here's just another look at anaphase in mitosis versus anaphase one in meiosis. So again, here's those centromeres. They're getting ripped apart in mitosis. Those single chromatids are getting pulled to opposite poles of the cell. Here in anaphase one of meiosis, we're keeping those pairs Sorry, we're, we're keeping the chromatids together. We're keeping the chromatids together, but we're separating the homologous pairs of chromosomes. So dad goes one way, mom goes the other. Dad goes one way, mom goes the other. This is when non-disjunction might occur. So non-disjunction is when those chromosomes do not correctly separate during anaphase. And it could happen during anaphase one, where we should have one of the homologous pairs go one way and the other go the other way. But this non-disjunction has occurred the chromosomes are not separating appropriately, and we end up with both of those guys going the same direction. And so now I have one gamete, almost a gamete, um, with that, that pair of chromosomes still, and I have this other one that's going to become a gamete that has none. And then we can have disjunction, that separation occur normally in this second stage, but we're gonna end up with each of these, let's say that these are the eggs, we're gonna have two eggs that have extra copies of this chromosome. We're gonna have two eggs that have no copies of that chromosome. If one of these guys gets fertilized, we're going to end up with 
trisomy. If this happens to be chromosome number 21, we could have trisomy 21. We have one, two, three copies of that chromosome. If one of these eggs gets fertilized, then we're going to have monosomy, only one copy of that chromosome um, that we're looking at. This um, non-disjunction, this failure to separate the chromosomes appropriately can also happen in anaphase two, which we're gonna talk about a little bit coming up. So anaphase one, let's say anaphase one, these chromosomes separated correctly. So homologous pair split up. I have one of each pair in each about to be an egg cell. And then maybe we had normal um, separation, normal disjunction happen here. But on this guy, we had non-disjunction. And so that chromosome stayed together, didn't get pulled apart. And so this egg has two copies and this egg has none. If this guy gets fertilized, again, we're going to have trisomy. This guy, if this guy gets fertilized, we'll have monosomy. Because we know that trisomy, um, for example, trisomy 21 can lead to some disorders, um, we sometimes will test for that in pregnancy. One way that we can test for these chromosomal number abnormalities, like trisomy 21, which is also called Down syndrome, um, we can test for this with amniocentesis. Amniocentesis is a process in which we use an ultrasound because we definitely want to make sure that we don't stab the baby with this needle that gets poked into that sac, that amniotic sac that the fetus is swimming in. Not swimming, it floats really. Um, the, the needle is going to suck out some of that fluid that the fetus is, is submerged in and then the cells that happen to be floating around in that fluid are gonna get sucked up into that syringe. We're going to grow them on a Petri dish. We're going to stain them and then make a karyogram picture and analyze the chromosomes to make sure that there aren't any chromosomal abnormalities. This usually happens a little bit later in the pregnancy, and this would only happen if there are concerns um, from normal ultrasounds. Amniocentesis is not uh, a normal test that is done unless there's an indicator saying that it should be done. If, if earlier in pregnancy, if earlier in pregnancy there seem to be con some concerns, then chorionic villus sampling can happen instead. Chorionic villus sampling is quite a bit riskier to the pregnancy, um, but it gets more cells it happens earlier in the pregnancy. So a catheter is actually going to be inserted through the vagina up into the uterus and a little bit of what we call chorionic villi is going to get pulled out of what is the developing placenta. Those cells would then be analyzed the same way that the amniocentesis would analyze cells to see if there are any chromosomal abnormalities. This again is going to happen only if there seem to be some very serious concerns about the health of the fetus. Um, this is a little bit risky to the pregnancy, so it would only be done if absolutely necessary. Um, so, so moving on, let's say that non-disjunction did not occur, that we had normal separation of our chromosomes. Uh, we're going to move into telophase one. So we're at PMAT and we're PMAT uh, in meiosis one. We finally made it to telophase one. This is a lot like mitosis. The chromosomes are going to uncoil, go back to chromatin. Nuclear membranes are going to reform. Cytokinesis will occur. We have those cleavage furrows forming. And then we'll have perhaps a little bit of interphase or interkinesis, but there will be no DNA replication, no DNA replication. We will then move into prophase two. So now we're in that second my, ooh, meiotic division, sorry second meiotic division, prophase two now. Uh, looks a lot like mitosis. The chromosomes are going to condense. We're gonna go back from chromatin to chromosomes. That nuclear membrane that we just made is gonna break back down. And that's it. So, so all the excitement that happens with the crossing over in prophase one, nope, not in prophase two. Only prophase one. Prophase two is a lot like mitosis. Metaphase two, also a lot like mitosis. We are going to line up 
the chromosomes, not in pairs, but in single files at the, at the middle of the cell. So once again, metaphase in the middle, but now we're not, not lining up in pairs, we're lining up single file. But what's cool is because we already went through one division, we are going to have two cells lining up in the middle. So two cells are both lining up in the middle, single file. Anaphase two, a lot like mitosis, the spindle fibers are going to pull those chromosomes apart at the centromere. We're going to pull those chromatids into opposite poles. Notice this guy's getting pulled apart and also this guy's getting pulled apart. Telophase two, we're going to have some nuclear membranes start to reform. Those chromosomes are going to once again uncoil and go back to chromatids. Tin, cytokinesis is going to occur again. Cleavage furrow, separate the cytoplasm and all those amazing um, uh, uh, organelles that are in the cell. Notice I've got one, two, three, four nuclei now. All of this meiosis results in lots of genetic variation, which is super important for a species to be able to survive. Um, Genetic variation is going to come from that crossing over. That recombination of some of the alleles is going to lead to some super interesting different combinations of chromosomes um, in the alleles. And then also once fertilization occurs, we're going to have even more combinations pop up. Independent assortment simply means that we're going to not necessarily send all of dad one way and all of mom the other way in these divisions, but instead they, those chromosomes are going to line up on each side of the middle of the cell independently of each other. So, so mom's chromosomes will line up independently of the other mom chromosomes. We don't have a dad side and a mom side. We have lots of random combinations. Um, different ways that those chromosomes can line up and be separated during anaphase one. And then of course, like I said, fertilization. After these things happen in both eggs and sperm, we get lots of unique eggs, unique sperm that will then combine to make some pretty special people. You. All right, let's name that phase. What do you think this is? What PMAT, PMAT one or PMAT two is this prophase one or two metaphase one or two anaphase one or two telophase one or two what do you think we're actually going to do five of these practices name that phase hopefully you are thinking metaphase two metaphase in the middle metaphase in the middle two because we have one two cells already formed how about this one what do we think this one is name that phase is it Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. I like either late anaphase or early telophase. One or two. Let's go with two because, of course, we have one, two, three, four groups being formed. So this must be meiosis two, either the very end of anaphase or the beginning of telophase. What about here? What do we think? It's looking like anaphase to me, those chromosomes are getting pulled apart, must be anaphase, but is it anaphase one or two? I like one because I don't have two groups being separated into four new groups. I have only two separate groups forming, which means that we're starting in anaphase one. How about here? What do we like? I think we like the very beginning of metaphase. These guys are almost to the middle, so we're working on some metaphase. Is it one or two? It's one, because we only have one middle. And in metaphase two, we would have two groups lining up. All right, our last practice phase. What do we like? I hope you are thinking telophase two. We have one, two, three, four cells, four gametes formed. Um, Telophase cytokinesis have both happened. Telophase two. My friends, we did it. 
we um, met our objectives. We distinguish between mitosis and meiosis. They both have PMAT. They both have interphase. Mitosis only does PMAT one time. Meiosis has PMAT one and PMAT two. We describe those stages of meiosis. The magic that happens in crossing over um, during prophase one, make sure that you know all of that. We defined non disjunction, which can happen in anaphase one or anaphase two, where the chromosomes fail to separate. Um, and then we get some kinds of trisomies or monosomies. And we did chat super briefly about the relationship between meiosis, um, the independent assortment, and crossing over and fertilization, and how that can lead to lots of genetic variation in a species. Good work today.